So as far as part A of the question is concerned, and notice that we've got 16 marks for the discussion, um, including professional marks. Professional marks is how have you set it out? Does it make sense? Have you started each word, each sentence, each area with a, a doing word rather than the first thing I consider is, the second thing I consider is? There are certain things which upset markers. And wonderful. So keep it to the point, keep it brief. Yeah. So If we do part A1, in terms of failure to meet users' needs, users compare the results of different companies when investing. This is very difficult if companies treat leases inconsistently between finance and operating. <coughs> Secondly, Many users adjust the accounts if they contain operating leases. They convert these into finance leases and increase both assets and lease liabilities. So the fact that people are adjusting the accounts, surely this suggests that existing accounts, existing financial statements, do not meet their needs. Now what they do is, is a lot of them, they will take the uh, operating lease expense and they'll multiply it by a number. And it's often known as the rule of eight. They'll take the operating lease expense, they'll multiply it by eight, and they say, well, that's the value of the asset and that's also the value of the liability. So it, they increase debt because they don't trust the way that we prepare the accounts. So that's failure to meet users' needs, but notice the question contains the word and. So the second issue we're looking at whether or not the current lease rules are conceptually flawed. 
Firstly, they're quite easy to manipulate. Many leasing companies create leases that just fall within the definition of an operating lease Secondly, we've got inconsistency with other financial instruments. Leases are not covered by IAS 39 and IFRS 9, etc. If leases were, con were covered by these standards, different figures would appear in the financial statements. And thirdly, the separation of leases into financing and operating produces significantly different ratios. So this is conceptually flawed because often the difference between a finance lease and an operating lease is very very small and yet the impact it can have on the accounts can be very very big. Surely that's wrong. So can you see what I tried to do as always each sentence two line maximum getting a few points in so that's part A1. If we now take a look at part A2, and in the real exam, people wrote very little for this. Discuss whether the plant operating lease in the financial statements of Holcomb meets the definition of an asset and liability as set out in the conceptual framework. What's the definition of an asset per the framework? An asset is something which is controlled by the business. Now if something is controlled by the business, we have the risks and rewards of ownership. It generates economic benefits
and it's due to a past event. So you'll pick up marks just from saying, well, I know what the framework says. <coughs> Let's apply that to the Holcomb lease. Um, it says Holcomb has leased plant for a fixed term of six years and the useful life of the plant is 12 years. It's non-cancellable and there are no rights to extend the lease term or purchase the machinery. There's no guarantee of its value. The lessor does not have the right of access to the plant until the end of the contract or Holcomb agrees. So can you see... Holcomb has the rewards of the asset because it can use it in the business. for six years. How Holcomb has the obsolescence risk for the next six years because the lease cannot be cancelled. So we do have risks and we do have rewards. The asset generates economic benefits because the plant is used to produce goods for Holcomb. And the lease agreement Signature is the past event. So do you see that it does appear to satisfy the definition of an asset? Therefore, the plant does satisfy the asset definition rules per the framework. Now let's again read this carefully. Discuss whether the plant operating lease in the financial statements of Holcomb meets the definition of an asset and liability. So we need another section to our answer. Every time we see the word and Mentally, that's another heading. So what is a liability? The definition per the framework
it's an obligation to transfer economic benefits And it's due to a past event. So if we now apply this <coughs> to Holcomb, the lease agreement gives Holcomb an obligation to pay to the lessor for the next six years. So we do have an obligation at the SFP date. The lease signing was the past event therefore we appear to have a liability So I've not written a huge amount, I've written two pages there, but they're, they're not the same size as ACCA pages, are they? But everything that I've tried to write, focus. And this is, you hear me shouting it every time I set a question, focus, focus, focus. Try to get as much down as you can in as few words. So that's part A. Let's now take a look at part B. So this appears to be a sale and leaseback. But let's read the question carefully. It says, show the accounting entries in the year of the sale and lease back, assuming that the operating lease is recognized as an asset. So what the examiner is asking us to do here is to apply the proposals for the changes to the way in which we're going to treat leases. So he says, ignore what you, what you currently deal with it, what are the proposals and the proposals are that all leases are going to be capitalized. Whenever you have a question break it down into smaller parts. So first of all we've got the sale of the asset So we have sold the asset for 150. We will credit PPE 120. And because we're going to bring the asset back into the accounts, we're not going to recognize a profit. If you were accounting for this under the old operating leaseback rules, you would have taken a profit of 30 million to the income statement but because the examiner has asked us to treat it differently under the proposed rules instead I'm going to credit deferred income 30 the company
then brings an asset into the financial statements at the present value of the lease payments. So that's what he has specifically asked us to do. What are the lease payments? Well, the lease payments are 16 million a year. Now, you could have done this as a calculation, but the examiner has given us some annuity tables. So it's going to be 16 million, an annuity for five years, is 3.993. Now you could have worked it out by taking 16 divided by 1.08 plus 16 divided by 1.0 squared, but if he's going to give us that number, let's work that out. And that works out as 63.9 million. So we debit asset 63.9 million and we credit lease liability 63.9 million. So that's the sale of the asset. This is the lease of the asset. Let's now calculate our interest and liability. So when did we sell the sign the lease? We signed the lease on the 1st of May X4. Now it looks like we're preparing the accounts for the year to the 30th of April X5. So I'm going to go the date the 1st of May X4. We've borrowed 63.9 million. What then happens over the rest of the year? Interest starts to clock up. And we're told that that interest is 8%. So that is 5.1. We make a cash payment at the end of the year of 16, so 63.9 plus 5.1. So our year end liability is 53. We need to do this for X5 as well because we need to split the liability between current and non current. So we've got 53, 8% is 4.2 we repay cash of 16 so our income statement entries will be the release of the deferred income. Remember we had deferred income of 30. Spread that over six years. That's going to be a five million dollar credit.
We're going to depreciation. We've put the asset in at 63.9. Spread that over six years. Is it five years? Oh, rats. So it is. Yep. So that should be, yes, that's five years. So that should be six. And that should be... Yeah, but when you release the deferred income, you debit deferred income and you credit income statement. Yep. So this should be over five years. Sorry, sorry for that. So that's a 12.8 million debit. Interest. Five point one million debit. If we look at the SFP, we'll have our asset. Our asset was sixty three point nine million, and we take away the depreciation. So we have an asset of 51.1 million and our liability will have a current and our non-current. Non-current is what we expect the liability to be in a year which is 41.2. We know that the total liability is 53, which means that the current liability is the balance, and it's 11.8. Okay, so that's what we're doing for the six marks. It's actually quite a lot to do there for six marks. And very few people got this right in the exam because they didn't read the question carefully enough. B2, it says we enter into a short operating lease for another building. The lease is for three years and is currently five million per annum, but an inflation adjustment will be made at the conclusion of years one and two. So this is our three-year lease. <coughs> we do not include the inflation adjustment until the increase has taken place. The inflation increase of 4%. Now, does this make sense? Well, it does make sense because, for example, uh, you might be given a pay rise spread over three years. So you might be told the pay deal is you get 2% this year, 3% next year, 4% the following year. But you don't add the 3% and the 4% to this year's wages, do you? Because revenues will be affected by inflation next year, so therefore expenses should be affected by inflation on a matching principle when the inflation actually arises. So all that we say here, year one, it's going to be 5 million year 2 it's going to be 5 million times 1.04 so it's 5.2 million year 3 assuming that inflation continues to rise
it will work out as 5.41 million. So rather bizarrely, the easiest part of the question was right at the very end. The, re the rest of it was quite challenging. 